Hello and welcome to Cyber Salon. My name is Ava Pascal. I will be your host for today. I'm the chair and co-founder of Cyber Salon. Uh, and today we'll be talking about money. Money usually, we have to work for money, but we would like to talk today about the situation if we can get money to work for us. So Cyber Salon is a digital futures think tank. We've been working for many years on improving uh, digital literacy, digital divide. Uh, recently, we've developed a new digital skills certificate for EU to replace European computer driving license, if you remember that. Uh, we also research on um, using digital to improve racial bias. We developed a game with Google that helps to improve teen perception of racial bias. Uh, and also, more recently, we've done a piece of research on COVID app and argued for decentralized framework, which I'm pleased to report the government has now decided to uh, go our way. Uh, so today we'd like to have a look at what's happening with digital money. So the government uh, is going to have a challenge with bringing the economy back after COVID, uh, there is a big spike in unemployment in US. We will probably see a big spike in unemployment in UK. Uh, so we just wanted to kick the tires and see what this new digital money has to offer. Uh, obviously, as Cyber Salon, we've been around Bitcoin debates pretty much right from the beginning. Um, there's a poster behind me from Bitcoin 2, uh, the conference we had with John Matonis and the guys from Ethereum back in 2014. We've also been busy mining and contributing to developing of Bitcoin network of trust, which is still amazing achievement. It's still being built, uh, but as a global network of trust, it's truly remarkable. Uh, so today I wanted to introduce the speakers. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, a number of aspects are basically digital currency, who can issue them on universal basic income, is it time and do we have UBI tech that can help us, uh, but also on blockchain, can blockchain make food cheaper and on digital privacy, are we ready for the post cash economy, do we have frameworks to protect our data. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. So maybe you can start from Keith Tier. Uh, British born, but live here in Palo Alto. I'm a many times entrepreneur. Actually, Ava and I were partners with, uh, with the other co-founders in Siberia Cafe back in the day and with uh, David at EasyNet. Came to the States, did real names and uh, uh, partnered with Mike Larrington for founding TechCrunch. And these days I run a UK investment fund called ADB along with the others and um, manage my own portfolio here in Palo Alto. And UBI is, is my passion. Thank you very much for inviting me, Ava. My name is Troy Norcross. Um, I run a strategy company called SER Team. And within that, I run the brand called Blockchain Rookies. And we do blockchain as a business strategy. So not so much technology focused, but more as a business strategy and we spend a lot of time educating people on exactly what blockchain can do versus what it can't do and trying to undo some of the blockchain hype. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Wendy Grossman. I uh, write things, as I say, I put words in a row, which is a line I heard from the science fiction writer, Bruce Sterling. Uh, I think of myself as a technology critic. So if you can drop in my slides, I can see lots of people who would be interested uh, in this topic. So we're, here we're trying to reclaim money. We're obviously going from a very difficult situation, uh, very traumatic for everybody, one that probably will not have a happy end anytime soon. So we wanted to examine with our experts what digital money can help us with. So if I can have the next slide, I took it from sort of very personal experience. Uh, if you look at the stats which ONS just released, it's all about index of production. And the straight drop in April and in May will be similar, it's about 5%. So last time produced, production has dropped by that much was in Thatcher's time, roughly 1979. And what it created was a lot of shortages. So if you look at the next slide. 
So this is where I was brought up. That's, that's Poland, roughly uh, 1979 or 80. And we had similar problems or for different reasons. So production has dropped because the uh, communist government couldn't just quite get the logistics going. Uh, and women were on the receiving end of it because we had money. Everybody had some cash, but you couldn't really buy anything with this cash. Uh, and women had to spend pretty much the whole day long trying to get something for the household and queuing from the beginning of the day to the end while also pretending to work. So I think at that point I started realizing that issuing money by central government is a little bit of a legacy system. So if you go for the next slide. So this is uh, the coupons that the government issued on top of money to allow people to buy stuff. So nothing in the shop, we had to register with these coupons. And they're actually quite cute because for those who understand Polish, uh, it's for uh, sweets, cigarettes, alcohol, chocolate, large, and washing powder, and obviously flour. As we're queuing now for flour, because everybody's baking, we were queuing for flour back in the 1980s. So the government first couldn't quite get their money right because of inflation and too much money in the system, not enough goods. Then they issued the coupons. I think the next one is even more interesting. So the next slide, Ben, this is for meat. And there was normal meat and there was special meat because the stuff in the corner shows meat with beef on the bone. So you're entitled to two of those, meat on the bone per week. Uh, and obviously people who were vegetarians were able to trade it. So the coupon itself became currency. So it was good and better meat for, for people who could trade it. And the next slide will show us what happened with people who were better people, because in communism, you might know from, from Orwell, there were peaks and there were better peaks. So better people always had shops, they were called PEVEX. And PEVEX shops were where you didn't buy things with Polish lotte or even with coupons, but you bought them with Polish dollar. So we had actually Polish dollar on top. So the government just kept issuing new currencies to try to make the system work, ending up with a very Kafka combination. So in this shop, as you can see, there's nothing fancy, just a bit of beer, cigarettes, ketchup, uh, pineapple, but it was a very special shop because actually there was something on the shelves. And with this Polish dollar, you could buy things in this shop. So we can move to the next slide. So you can see this is jeden dollar, one dollar. So uh, that was what we were buying things with. Uh, and that made me think that actually the best way forward is to take really this legacy system of issuing money, or dollars or anything weird and just try to decentralize it because the system is just too complex for doing anything uh, like giving the governments the power over how we live and our supply chain. So the last slide is about who could be uh, doing the issuing. So who could be working on it. So if you move to the next slide then, that will show us the London pound uh, because I'm thinking who can possibly be issuing the money to actually try to get things off the inflation and the mess of mismatch of local tax, local spend, and what's happening with the environment. Okay, and on that point, uh, I wanted to hand over to David. Uh, and what is the challenge for you? Who can possibly uh, be the right person to issue the new currencies. If the governments are failing, you have a book coming out with lots of ideas. Who could be issuing currencies? Well, in my, in my last book, actually, Eva, <clears throat> uh, which I'll just mention, Before Babylon Beyond Bitcoin, in my last book, I had the, I had the five C's to make it easy for people to remember. So I said, well, the technology is very decentralized. And new technology means anybody can create money. So given that now anybody can create money, who will? And I, I came up with five categories. So first of all, um, central banks, which we'll come back to a bit later on. I don't want to talk about that right now. So central banks, commercial banks, which is the system that we have now, essentially. I should just say, 
having digital money issued by central banks is actually a radical change to the system we have now. That's not keeping things the same. Because right now, almost all of the money in circulation is created by commercial banks. 97% of the sterling is in the form of bank credit. So how, you could have digital currency that's issued by commercial banks. That would keep the system the same way as it is now. A third possibility would be to allow companies to issue money. So you could take away the privilege of money creation from purely from banks and just let any company, I mean, with a, you know, a certain balance sheet requirement, you could let any, any company create money. Um, fourthly, you could give up having anybody and just let cryptography do it for you. So this would be the, the world of the Bitcoin maximalists. And finally, you could have communities do it. And I began to think the more I spent time looking at this, that, you know, it wouldn't necessarily decentralize down to the level of individuals, but it might decentralize down to the level of communities. Uh, this is my sort of back to the future version of it, where we, we, we kind of go back to where money came from. So money is no longer global and universal. <clears throat> we actually have lots of monies, but those monies using the modern technology somehow reflect the values of the communities that they serve. So you could imagine, just to pick an example, you could imagine an Islamic money. I mean, there could be a billion people around the world who want to use Islamic money, and that money using smart contracts, I know they're not smart, they're not contracts, APIs and whatever, could implement certain values. So my five Cs were central banks, commercial banks, companies, cryptography, and communities. Now, I said in the book, in the case of communities, which kinds of communities would be uh, most likely? Which would make sense? And I am a big fan of the writings of, of uh, Jane Jacobs, no longer with us. Um, Jane Jacobs wrote a very influential book called Cities and the Wealth of Nations in the 80s. And she argued that one of the reasons why national economies are so difficult to manage is because there is actually no such thing as a national economy. There isn't, there isn't a British economy. There's an economy of London and its hinterland. There isn't a French economy. There's an economy of Paris and its hinterland, of Marseille and its hinterland. There's no American economy. There's an economy of New York and its hinterland, Chicago and its hinterland, Los Angeles and its hinterland. So she said, if we want to make the economy work better, we should make it more city centric. This goes, and this is no longer science fiction stuff. You know, the World Economic Forum talk about the city-centric future and smart cities. So your example of a London pound, I don't see as far-fetched at all. I think, in fact, for a variety of reasons, I think getting, getting London out of sterling would be a very good idea. At the time of the Norman invasion, London was about a fifth of UK GDP. It's now a quarter of UK GDP and still growing. It distorts the British economy no end. So suppose you took up your idea and had a London pound. That would mean that the value of sterling for the rest of the country would depreciate against the value of the London pound. That means people in London would invest their money in goods, services and productive opportunities in the rest of the UK because it would be cheaper. And the argument is, and by the way, I agree with this argument, floating exchange rates between regions are more effective than government transfer payments moving spending around and if you want uh, if you want um, uh, some support for this idea I should mention that there's a bill in the New York State Senate which will fail but nonetheless there's a bill there to create New York money I read only today that Akron Ohio has started issuing its own money as if that's not enough and uh, by odd coincidence I read that the rapper Akon who I'd never heard of until I read this story but the rapper Acon is building a city in Senegal uh, where all the goods and services will be paid for using its own currency. So what you put up as an amusing diversion, Eva, um, I regard as an entirely plausible and in many ways wholly desirable future for money. We will, be, we will be pioneering London coin uh, I was just amazed when I was doing my work on high streets. I've done two massive reports for the government on the re revival of the high street. And during gathering data for that, we realized that actually 
London pretty much keeps everybody going and every single city in UK out of London is in a massive negative. You know, Manchester costs billions, Birmingham costs billions. Nobody really is even near positive. So we have, we have to really bring it locally and rebalance. But uh, we will come back to that. So if I can just have Keith uh, talking about his concepts and his thinking on how to fix the post-COVID economy and possibly the lack of cash and lack of employment that might follow. Because even today, another couple of retail companies have announced thousands of layoffs, thousands. And there is no time to retrain. Obviously, retraining will have to happen, but we'll need a lot of time to do that. People need help today, and the state does not appear taking strong participation. So what's your thinking, Keith? So um, it's interesting that the number came out today that 47.5 million Americans have now signed up for unemployment benefits. 47 million. Um, uh, but I want to start by saying that my approach to this is not driven by a welfare mentality. Uh, I, I was raised in a working class family. I was the oldest child, single mom, and we qualified for free school meals and all kinds of other benefits. And my mom hated handouts. So she kind of raised us to figure out how to make money. And, um, and, and so I, I kind of grew up with this hatred of charity because it kind of demeaned me and made me less than a full human being because I needed a handout. So my approach to this is not welfare driven. It's more to do with um, progress. It feels to me as if automation inevitably is going to lead to worklessness. And what we've seen in COVID is just an acceleration of worklessness. Many of those jobs won't come back. Um, Think about retail stores that Amazon is opening that don't have um, normal levels of employment because they're self-serve. Or think about a little bit later than anyone thinks, but not too long in the future, self-driving trucks and cars. Uh, we already know on the London Underground they're thinking about self-driving trains. So worklessness is, is going to be part of the human experience. And worklessness gives rise to the question, how do people eat? and live and it feels to me as if society whether local or global is going to need to answer that question and the answer is going to be uh, it's, it's contained in this brilliant novel written in 1939 called for us the living uh, i forget the author's name but he's a very famous american science fiction writer um, somebody can remind us after i finish um, and in for us, the living, everyone in, uh, somebody dies in 1939 and wakes up in 2083. And in 2083, everyone has something called a heritage check. And it's called a heritage check because it's your right as a human being to, to share in the heritage of all previous human beings. Um, it's your right to live. And so you get this check. And in this novel, um, the, the central character is a woman who every Friday performs a dance in front of a flat screen for the world and people give her additional heritage credits for her performance. And so she works as well. Um, and it's a, basically a, um, a money is printed, given to everybody, supply meets demand in order that the money can be spent and you can earn more on top by working. That seems to me a fairly rational view of the future, but as we've seen with Libra, if we want to do the print currency and distribute it and have it be spendable, unfortunately, we live in this 19th century nation state world where regulatory authorities will do everything in their power to stop you. So Libra has changed. It's no longer a currency. It's now a symbolic representation of underlying nation state based currencies. Uh, and it therefore is less interesting and less useful. So what I came up with is, uh, and you can read about this at ubinetwork.org, is something called a universal wallet. A universal wallet is a wallet that can accept any spendable token, including London pounds or uh, Acrons or any other one. Um, every, every human being would have this wallet and any entity that wanted to publish money into it 
with rules about where that money could be spent can. Uh, and uh, we, it, let's assume that the minimum you want people to have every month just to make up a number is $1,000. And let's assume that the, the local currency is put, put into that, let's say $500, then uh, we have a second entity which, will, which is called your dollars. It's U-R dollar sign, your dollars, which stands for universal rewards dollars, but it's spoken as your dollars. We'll top up everyone's wallet to whatever the amount is. Uh, if, if the wallet isn't full of spendable tokens, given by by the uh, the, uh, the local currencies and our particular insight is that not just London but individual merchants can put spendable coupons in here just like they do today when you go with a discount coupon to Safeway uh, or Sainsbury's so so Sainsbury's can put you know two hundred dollars a year in to spend for everyone knowing that when you spend $200, they'll only accept it, let's say, for 20% of your bill. Therefore, you're going to spend $1,000 in order to spend the 200. So it's a customer acquisition token, but it's real money and you can buy real goods and services with it. So our wallet's going to be open not just to local currencies, but also to merchant currencies. We think the end result of all of that will be a wallet which will allow you to live based on uh, everything. And your dollars will be one for one with every other input. So if, uh, if London Pound wants to put pounds in, it has to put one pound for one your dollar. That will make everything exchangeable at parity um, and, and uh, allow, uh, uh, if you like, uh, floating exchange rates are dealt with by how many, uh, how many fractions of a London Pound get spent for the same your dollar. I don't want to go further than that because I have to get into detail. I think that's probably enough to scope the conversation, Ava. Great, yes. So it's basically taking the UBI concept and looking at different way of financing it. Uh, so David, can I bring you in response to that? What, what's your view of that structure? Uh, let me just figure out, turn it on again, there we go. Um, well, I, I guess I, I break my response into two parts. So on the UBI, uh, I mean, I, I sort of agree quite strongly with this. I think it, it's surprising to me that people think of UBI as a kind of socialist, uh, you know, doomed, uh, you know, um, way of organizing things. Because, of course, the great proponent of UPI was Hayek. I mean, he saw it as the as a you know, a freedom project, you know, that essentially if there's more, if there's more people than there are work, well, just give them the money. You know, it's, uh, you know, some people will do other things, some people won't. And it would have the great merit, you know, certainly in the UK of removing sort of means testing and benefits and just get rid of the whole thing and just pay everybody UBI every month. Now, as to the question, and by the way, the universal wallet is, is, I think, um, it's kind of it's I think it's a little bit more complicated than that because I, I, I first of all I think people should because you're going to run into problems about privacy and so on which I know Wendy is going to get into in a moment so so the idea that people would have one wallet I'm not I'm not sure about that people should have several and whether any government would ever allow you to issue wallets to people without KYC and so on I mean I think they should but um, I don't know if they would but as to the question of the currencies I'm not sure about the one-to-one -one. I can see the attraction of fixed exchange rates because the assumption would be it's too complicated for people to think to themselves, oh, do I need two London pounds or one Wessex pound or, or whatever. Uh, but actually, if you look into the future, of course, people won't be in that loop, really, because it will be, it will be bots and AIs you know, doing it. So, so you know, when, I, when I look at something on my phone, it will you know, in, a, in a currency that makes sense to me, my phone will tell me, well, these concert tickets cost, you know, two London pounds. But when I press the button to buy them, what actual currencies get moved around and transacted? That takes us more into Edward de Bono's territory, the IBM dollar, where baskets of digital assets will be exchanged because you don't need the, you don't need the intermediary of money anymore to do that. So 
so I, I think, you know, the idea of having some sort of um, universally accessible wallet, uh, you know, that's very shaped by my experiences on Mondex and M-Pesa and things like that. And I'm, I, I think it's, you know, complicated. And the issue of the tokens, I, there's lots of reasons why I would prefer floating exchange rates with lots and lots of different assets being exchanged. But on the core point of should we begin considering UBI as a, as a way out of this problem, I would say yes. And given that I just, I just read in the, in the newspaper, well, a metaphorical newspaper, I mean, on my iPad, the Bank of England just created a hundred billion pounds today by buying government bonds with magic money that it made up in a spreadsheet. Well, there are people out there, Francis Coppola, for example, wrote a very good book about this last year. There are people out there who think actually, instead of having quantitative easing, um, whereby you, you, give, you, you, know, you invent money and you give it to banks and then they keep it and pay it to each other and bonuses and, and whatever they do with it. If instead you had real helicopter money and the government invented money and just gave it to people, that might be a better way forward. And I sort of agree with that. So on the UBI concept, I think I'm coming around to that way of thinking. On the implementation, I probably am too nerdy and too involved with it now. So I have very fixed ideas about that sort of thing. Okay, well, let me run a couple of uh, quick polls just to see where our people are thinking. Uh, let me just find the right one. Uh, right, so on the, I'm just launching it now. So on the UBI, who should manage universal basic income? State with direct payments, retailers via international loyalty coupons, cities, by local UBI, maybe Google and Apple points, maybe Visa MasterCard points or other. So please express your preferences. We'll give it a minute. I think the uh, panelists can vote as well. So let's just see where, where it is. Right, so still stay direct payments. Okay, if you have to work harder on persuading people, but uh, pretty close to cities and local UBI. I think it sounds intuitively quite close to what we want to see, but also quite a few others. So I think we will explore that further later. I'm going to stop sharing, but there's another poll which I wanted to see what you guys think on digital currency. So I'm going to launch it now. So which digital currency will succeed? Do you think Bitcoin, digital dollar, London coin, China coin, or others? I could say strong Bitcoin group, but now others, maybe ones that we don't know about yet. China coin, strong contender. Okay, we're going to end the poll, share results. Right, so by small margin Bitcoin. These people uh, are crazy, crazy. <laughs> these, are, these are religious lunatics, don't listen to them. You've got no, them. No, we have very, very non-religious lunatics on the audience. You know, we have Tivo who used to work with us on the first digital checkbook and a uh, few people who are deeply involved in it. So you never know, you never know. Okay, okay. so thank you. I agree with the Bitcoin voters, but not for UBI. No, not for UBI. Right. With the best digital currency has not been invented yet. So I think... Well, I certainly think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I, the, one of the aspects of the Bitcoin thing... I, I went to the very first European Bitcoin conference, actually, in Prague many, many years ago. So I, I feel like I've seen it from the very beginning. But why do you think that we'd like accidentally stumbled across the optimum form of money for the universe until the end of time seems odd to me. You know, it's like it's the one true money. You're uh, thinking about response. Well, I, I think I think David's response is normal, and, and I think that would be most people's response. But I think there are some things we should take into account. The, the first is that Bitcoin um, is largely used as a as a highly speculative store of value. What does that mean? Uh, well, the world has always need, needed stores of value. And it, it's especially needed it 
when national currencies become volatile. And, you know, just as when Britain was replaced by the states, we went through the gold standard and Bretton Woods and all kinds of decisions about what the store of value should be for the world. We now at this point in history where the dollar and China are clearly in a 50 year transition period, which may even be quicker than that. And the dollar, which plays the dominant role as a basket in most reserves is not gonna play that role forever. The world's gonna be forced to ask the question, what is the store of value that you know, we all use? It could be gold, it could be physical things, but a digital store of value is not crazy if, if we all buy into it, because the, the validity of a store of value is only relative to people's trust in it. So if we all decided it was Bitcoin, then it would be Bitcoin and it would be stable. It's really about choosing. So I'm not as negative on Bitcoin, broadly speaking. I think, I think history will tell the story and Bitcoin may be just a fad or a sect but it could also be the next store of value for the world. Certainly national digital currencies will not play that role. It's possible a basket of digital currencies as envisioned by Libra could play that role to even out volatilities. But even that kind of doesn't make sense. Ultimately, the world settles on one. It was the dollar most recently. It isn't gonna be the Renimbi, I don't think, for any, any long time to come anyway. So I do think there's an open question and I'm, I'm not as negative on Bitcoin as, as I assume David is based on what he just said. Right, okay. So I think at this point we should move to Troy. Uh, Troy, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes. Yes, so Troy has been uh, pioneering blockchain and trying to make intelligent things with it. So do you want to tell us about your thoughts on where it's landed, where it will land, and what are you doing to poke it forward? <laughs> um, so with regards to blockchain, as it relates to cryptocurrency, I always say it's a little like comparing email and the internet. I mean, all email runs on the internet, but the internet runs a whole lot more than just email. And all cryptocurrency runs on blockchain, but the blockchain runs so much more than just cryptocurrency. So the first thing I have to do with a lot of people in the enterprise space is to help them separate the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrency. And it's, it's a really important piece to do. Um, I also get asked a lot of times, how much money should I invest in cryptocurrency? And I always tell them it's the three day Vegas rule. How much would you spend on a three day trip to Vegas? You know, at the roulette wheel, you know, on flights and hotels back in the days when we could travel. And that's how much you should invest in cryptocurrency because it's largely a speculative asset. Um, we've been talking quite a lot here and I, I've really enjoyed the conversation about you know, money and cryptocurrency and money as a currency. So what is the difference? So money is a store of value. Money is a medium of exchange. Money is a unit of account. Currency is a medium of exchange and a unit of account, but it's not a store of value. And so when you talk about cryptocurrency, so it's not going to be a store of value, which means a whole lot of different things with different cryptocurrencies in this space that can indeed add value. Um, I also don't think digital currencies like a digital renminbi or a digital dollar or a digital Akron dollar or whatever they're calling it, I don't consider those to be cryptocurrencies because they are indeed linked typically to some level of assets. Um, Libra, I happen to be a huge fan of, of Libra. I, I love the initiative of what they were trying to do. And I always get angry with people when they say, oh, Libra, it's Facebook's coin. I'm like, no, this is not Zuckbucks. This is not currency made by Mark Zuckerberg. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, Facebook is a data company. They want to see all the transactions. They want to know the people. They want to make money from actually monetizing transactions from their marketplace on and off their network. They would have used Bitcoin if they could, but Bitcoin wouldn't perform. So they created Libra as a cryptocurrency and they knew they couldn't do it long standing. So they created the Libra Association and they placed it in Switzerland and they started off doing that you know, in a very far, far distance. Um, with regard to UBI and a universal wallet, as long as it's a decentralized wallet and it's not controlled by anybody and your UR dollars, you know, love the idea of, of UR dollars or your dollars or whatever that happens to be that you were referring to. And 
it's sloshing around as euro dollars in this decentralized bit. But just like most cryptocurrencies, in order to use them, you got to convert them back to fiat currency. You got to convert them back to pounds. You got to convert them back to sterling. You got to convert back to, to renminbi, to whatever, to actually be able to use them. And it's those exchange points, those on ramps and off ramps that the governments are using to control. They're using it to control all of those aspects. We can have as much exchanges as we want in cryptocurrency land, but it's always, you got to move it back to fiat before you can actually use it. I mean, the idea of Bitcoin being exchangeable and usable everywhere. I mean, starting with the Silk Road back in the day, and yes, there are a few places that accept Bitcoin now, but they're, they're few and they're far between. The last one I'll make before I hand off to one of the other panelists is when it comes to UBI, universal basic income, I love the idea, but it's only solving half the problem. Um, and as an American, I could say, especially for Americans, it's only solving half the problem because I can have enough money to have my basic needs met. You know, whether it's housing and shelter and food and, and, and the basics, that's great for UBI. But it doesn't give me a reason to get out of bed. There's no purpose. And I think that a lot of people want to have a sense of worth and currently jobs give both income and a sense of purpose. And so I think UBI is only half a solution to a, a much larger problem. And I'll, and I'll leave it there. And, and thanks very much for asking. Great. Thank you very much, Troy. Um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I was brought up in a system which had not so much a universal basic income, but like nobody got paid much for anything. You know, my auntie was a director of a big hospital and she was a leading psychiatrist, but she used to earn the same with her cleaner. And, you know, nobody was particularly surprised about it. That's how it was in communism. So it was to everybody according to their needs, which is basic food, but from everybody according to their abilities. And I can tell you, the middle class work like dogs to create something interesting. My parents were big believers in communism, and they really, really worked hard to make it happen. Uh, but people who were the workers, who were the key workers, they were a lot less enthusiastic. And you know, any opportunity they had to duck and dive and not to come to work, pull a sickie, do as little as possible, they did. And that's what resulted in empty shelves because, you know, the intellectuals were all great fun and it was all very interesting, but it wasn't interesting if you were working on the, you know, in the mines and earned the same, that person who did a lot less. So I think it's a difficult one, you know, human nature, we, we love to comp compete, but we also, are quite sensitive about value and that was a big reason why communism has failed because it kind of felt wrong and eventually if enough people feel it's wrong it will go and i think we have the same now it feels wrong in the other way it feels wrong that disparities are so big and that some of us are a lot more wealthy than others without actually doing very much so i think we are coming to the same question enough of us thinks it's wrong it's wrong so on the point, can I just run a quick poll? Because I'd love to know what you guys think about the blockchain applicability. This is something I've been looking a lot recently. So I'm just going to launch the poll. So choose the best blockchain use case. So is it about provenance and making sure the chicken we have in the shops is not chlorinated? Fast fashion provenance, you know, making sure what we buy is not from somewhere that mistreats workers, document management, diamonds provenance, that seems to be big use, and health insurance, medical data. I know, Troy, that you don't think medical data is appropriate for Bitcoin. I have followed your teaching with great interest, but I have also noticed a whole bunch of startups in that place. So I'm just curious, what do people think? Uh, so let me just finish it now and share the results. Right, so most people are practical and document management and time stamping seems to be the winner, but also some interest in chlorinated chicken provenance <laughs> and a little bit of a health insurance. So how would you answer that? What's your take? So I'm looking at the results. So yeah. uh, chlorinated chicken and chicken tracking. I mean, chickens on the blockchain started with Carrefour about three years ago. So they've been doing that provenance tracking for, for quite some time. I think that's probably a, a pretty usable 
case, Walmart and the IBM Food Trust have been doing their project now for more than three years, tracking leafy green vegetables. And Walmart did the great thing with the IBM Food Trust of expanding it to Unilever, to Carrefour, you know, to uh, Nestle. And a lot of people are using the system and it's, it's being used very much that way. Fast fashion provenance. Um, it's one of those things that a lot of people want to know, where did my clothing come from? Was child labor involved? Was it actually ethically produced? You know, what was the green credentials of shipping? And they don't want to look at the data, but they want to know they can. And that doesn't add much except in brand value. And the real value in all of that actually comes because you're putting your supply chain onto the blockchain. You're making it more transparent and it reduces the cost of ensuring your supply chain which is an interesting kind of side benefit. Document Excellent. management is interesting, but it's not, it's not really document management. It's much more kind of proving with a timestamp that something happened. So it's proof of prior art, very important in things like digital rights, intellectual property, and things like that. And health and medical data, I always say, you know, you're on an immutable blockchain. You don't ever put health data onto the blockchain. You can use blockchain in a health context to control and manage access to data, but data itself doesn't live on the blockchain. It doesn't handle large queries. It's not a relational database. It doesn't handle large files. You don't put x-rays onto the blockchain. And the analogy I always give people is a blockchain is nothing more than an Excel sheet that's been shared with multiple people with protected cells. And so if you're saying, should we put this on the blockchain? Ask yourself, would I put it into an Excel sheet and share it with 10,000 people? And if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't put it onto a blockchain. I wouldn't put a whole bunch of health data into an Excel sheet and share it. I wouldn't put seven gigabytes of Game of Thrones video into an Excel sheet and share it. And I wouldn't put 100 million ad impressions from the Financial Times into an Excel sheet and share it. And, and I'll leave it there. Yes, thank you very much. It looks from the chat that we all agree that the most interesting thing about it is the identity issue, which uh, I know David has a lot to say about. Oh, if you're going to talk about self-sovereign identity, we can do an entire hour just on that. You know, I'm very tempted, but that's for the next time. But I just wanted to ask David to come back on it. Uh, so, uh, as I just said in the chat, oh, sorry, let me put the thing back on. So, um, I, I'm a, I'm a little bit skeptical about um, you know supply chain and things like that. It's really not obvious to me. I mean, sorry to use a, a, an example that's close to home, but that that Polish guy who put the horses in the mincer and said that they were beef, it, he doesn't care whether you're putting that on newspaper on paper or on the blockchain. On the blockchain, it would be immutably false. Uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't make any difference to but the, David. To can the, I interrupt you on that particular sure, point? Yeah. So I, I think I've had this discussion like three different times and it's a really poignant discussion. Blockchain doesn't solve the issue of false information because that happens Correct. whether it's on paper Correct. or whether it's on, on digital form. Correct. What blockchain does is it provides a single golden record between multiple distrusting parties and adds efficiency to supply chain, but doesn't solve the issue of false data going in. I, I'm... I'm tempted to argue with you some more about that, Troy, because in the blockchain use cases that I've been asked to look at professionally, that the problem has always come down to that data sharing. And, and the fact is because people don't have the same standards and it's all incompatible. And the blockchain as a, an organizing principle for getting people to sit around and finally sort that out, that, that's a good thing. Um, but they could just as easily sit around and sort it out on a database. It's just not as interesting to them. So I'm, I'm a little more skeptical about that. Where, where I think the blockchain scores is when you come down to these issues around transparency and accountability. And this is where it might feed into the identity space. So, so personally, and, and again, I have a narrow prism. I'll accept that criticism. Um, I'm interested in, in issues around accountability. So, so the idea that, and, and this is where the sort of modern cryptography that excites me comes into play because things like zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, cryptographic blinding, when you take these kind of things and stir them into the blockchain plot, then you get these kind of privacy enhancing record systems, which mean that uh, I just posted a link with an example in it, which was a real example, which was to do with American Express. 
the fact that I could go to the blockchain and compute that your assets exceed your liabilities and therefore know that your business is solvent without actually being able to read what any of those assets or liabilities are, I, I can see that as the foundation of new ways of working. So, so I, tend to, I tend to look towards the, the, the transparency and accountability parts. Where that applies to, and I'm perfectly open to criticism on that because that's an area I want to learn more about. Where I think that intersects with the identity stuff is that, and in fact, the, the, the COVID crisis has revealed the, the absence of digital identity infrastructure has proved uh, absolutely catastrophic. I mean, the nonsense that we've had to go through here for banks to get, um, you know, COVID support to people. When you, you have thousands of small businesses trying to open accounts and it takes two weeks and you have to send 10 copies of your passport. Well, that's a bad example because in, in the UK, we have the gold standard of the British Gas Quarterly Bill, which we use for all of our identity needs. But nevertheless, the lack of that identity infrastructure has been thrown into pretty sharp relief. So I have a feeling, I'm not a gambling person, as you could probably tell from my earlier comment, but if I, if I had to gamble on something in the blockchain space, I, I would look more towards um, identity and I would look more towards transparency and accountability as the, as, the, uh, as the big narrative around that sort of thing. Right, this is, yeah, sorry, Keith, come back on it, yeah. Look, David, I, I'd love to talk with you more about that. I, I, I actually think UBI and my concept of a universal wallet and identity are all interconnected. It, it's very hard to imagine UBI without there being identity. And it's very hard to imagine identity being left to governments. Um, I've mentioned I agree. That, I agree strongly with that, Keith. Um, I mentioned in, uh, in the chat that this project called Bright ID, which is early and small, but I think quite promising conceptually, that promises um, non-duplicative, non, non unique identity that nonetheless remains anonymous. So it can guarantee you are a human being. There is only one of you and you do exist. Um, uh, and it isn't too cumbersome at the level of implementation, but I, I'm searching for the solution there because I think if you had that, you issued every one of those people a wallet and the wallet could be, have currency issued into it by any entity that wanted to publish into it. Taking into your account, your, your point about variable exchange rates, I'm fine with that. I'm, the convenience of not doing that attracted me, but I'm, I'm open on that. It feels as if, if you put all that together, there is actually a path forward. And I, I'm, I'm a kind of a product guy, so I want to build something. And I'd let, I almost want the world to react to what I do as opposed to thinking it all through ahead of time as well. Um, so that's me. <laughs> okay, well, we need product guys, as long as they reflect on things. So hopefully we will support the reflection. So can I bring Wendy? to comment on that shift towards digital identity and uh, certain entities knowing not only what you do, but what you buy and having a view on it. I know you, you looked into the digital food stamps in the US and the censoring of digital food stamps and state having a view what people buy. So how, how can we unbundle that? Well, I, I didn't exactly look into it. I read a story about it. Um, yeah. But yes, there have been problems in the in the states with um, food benefits being paid on a smart card, which then the government can object to what people buy. They can, they you know, where you can give people if you give people cash, you can't control what they do with it. But if you give them, if you give them a digital uh, wallet of some kind, you can you can prohibit. They can't buy it for use it for tobacco. They can't use it for sweets, soda, I don't know. One of the really interesting things about cryptocurrencies, which I realize were, are not the same as digital currencies, but one of the really interesting things about cryptocurrencies is that they were built by people who distrust governments. And they're built by people who distrust international institutions as well. Someone has brought up on the chat system, uh, why, why are there no mentions of the United Nations or other international bodies in this? And of course, one of the reasons is that the people who created Bitcoin absolutely loathe those things. Uh, I think they almost distrust them more than they distrust the US government, if such a thing is possible. 
Um, and, you know, so one of the problems we have is if whatever system you're going to put in place has to be something people trust. But right now, the reason we are talking about possible replacements is because we are living in a time of extreme uncertainty. And so it seems to me we've got this collision between the fact that people are feeling uncertain and they want something that they can trust, but we're also producing things that are unfamiliar, which they actually have no reason to trust. And so I, I, I think you're, I think in terms of human beings, I think you're, what you're proposing is really difficult. Um, and I also think that the level of change you're talking about, there are a lot of people who really do want very profound change, but there are also a lot of people, and unfortunately, a lot of them are in charge, who actually, what they really want is for all of this to go away and for us to get back to the way things were. And I think the collision between those two desires is going to be what really shapes the next sort of four or five years where people were where there is this tension between the desire for familiar stability and the desire for better lives and, a ch and, and change. And what will come out of it is going to be really interesting, but I don't think it's as simple as, you know, we'll give everybody a digital wallet and, and, and then, then we've solved it. Um, you know, somebody mentioned gold. I have never seen the point of gold. Uh, and if you look at the recent lockdown, the early in the lockdown, what were the things that people really wanted and really would have traded? Toilet paper, flour, and chocolate, <laughs> and, I, and, and alcohol, and I would say, and, and, and social contact. And I would say if you had any of those things, you would rather have them than have gold. Because um, gold is really a pretty useless thing to have. I mean, it's nice and it's stable and it's pretty and everything, but there's, there's not a lot you can do with it in, in everyday life as a normal thing. Um, I, th I think gold is, gold is a luxury. It's, it, you know, it comes in when you can afford to have abstract, abstract money, as it were. I can't personally come down against universal basic income because I think, I think you know, everyone should have, should, people should not live their lives in fear. But... Um, the thing I worry about is that whoever is distributing universal basic income at some point is going to have the incentive to try to make it cheaper. And so they're inevitably going to start saying things like, well, these people have too many children. We shouldn't allow people to have this many children. We should limit the number of children they can, that they can get income for. Or they're going to start saying, well, these people are rich. They don't really don't need this money. Or they're going to start saying, these people shouldn't qualify because. And we've had, you know, in both the United States and the United Kingdom, we've had a lot of issues about immigration in the last five years that really, or 10 years, that really come down to exactly that. These people should not have what we have. And I think you're going to have a very hard time developing a system that isn't um, vulnerable to that particular human issue. And the other thing I was going to do is I was just going to hold up David's new book so you can all see it. <laughs> Thank you. David's new book. <laughs> and now you can all tell me I I'm wrong about I'm... everything. The, the, the current is cold war. You've got to buy it. Great, Wendy. Thank you very much. I've got a question from Paul on in, uh, income equality and asset inflation are caused by central banks setting the price of money rather than the markets. Discuss. So I think that's probably David's question. Would you like to take it? I think it's tr it's true to say. So hold on, where are we? It, it, it's certainly true to say that in our economies. So you know, if I'm talking about the UK or the US, um, the price of of assets is determined by the amount of money in circulation, um, or you know, to to use a sort of London centric example. Um, what do you think the problem is in London? Is it a shortage of housing or a surplus of money? And people assume it's a shortage of housing, but actually it's not quite as clear cut at that. Um, a surplus of money drives up those prices. Now, um, if I'm an old rich person who votes, uh, I'm quite happy with that because I want to see asset prices driven up because I have assets. If I'm a young poor person who doesn't vote, uh, it's not very good for me because it means the, the value of my money goes down and the assets 
I want to buy become ever more expensive. So from that point of view, I mean, without being cynical, you can see how we got into the current state of affairs. Um, what would happen if there was no central control um, is, I think, quite unpleasant to think about. So uh, I posed the question in the chat, but I'll, I'll say it again here now. For contrast purposes, let's imagine the alternative scenario. Let's imagine that cryptocurrency has triumphed and that Bitcoin is the only money in the world. So we're all using Bitcoin and everyone's happy and we all have our Bitcoin wallets and we all transact. And I mean, yes, you know, sea level had to go up 30 feet and parts of Australia are underwater or whatever, but never mind. We're all using Bitcoin and we're all happy. What would be the government response to the COVID crisis in this case? because neither the government nor the central bank would be able to put more money into the economy. This is the dream of the, uh, of the, um, the maximalists, the, the, you know, the digital gold. So what happened when the economy went south and we were on a gold standard and you couldn't create more money? Well, it, it wasn't good, you know? So the idea that money should be freed, if I stress, if you live in a, democratic society, the idea that money shouldn't be under democratic control, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. I'm not sure. The idea, you know, then you get into the kind of Wall Street versus Main Street and the cross of gold and all this kind of thing. And I'm not sure we want to go in that direction. So I like the idea of having lots of different kinds of money. Um, should they be completely free of control i that's a much harder argument to make i think the market has to be regulated in in some ways right okay well it's it's complicated as they say but i've just got a one quick poll i wanted to check how you guys actually use your money at the moment so how do you pay for your beer drinks in the pub on friday is it cash cash apple pay or other so is Wendy right that cash is not dead? I certainly had to use it for weeks, if not months, but uh, she argues that there is still use for that. So let me just give you another. Well, you can, Richard, I can see that we're not allowed to drink in the pubs at the moment, but I had a pub <laughs> like of my pub under watchful eye of the police so it can be done right so i'm sharing the results so basically card rather than cash a little bit of apple pay cash still there so what do you think wendy about that general sense of where cash is sitting i think a third of people paying by cash is a pretty substantial amount i don't believe that for a moment um I think, honestly, I think that cash is, like a lot of other things, unevenly distributed. We talk about London, but London is not one monolithic thing. London is hundreds of communities and hundreds, uh, you know, I don't know how many languages are spoken in London, but I think it's more than a hundred. And each of those communities is going to have different norms. And you and Ava and some of these other folks are in a segment whose norm is not to use cash, but it's not universal. And for example, uh, the skeptics in the pub in, is held in an old pub in Greenwich that you know refuses to move on. For, you know, it won't serve tea because traditionally pubs didn't serve tea. And I'm not. I, I'm not convinced. It may take cards, but I don't think they like you if you pay that way. <laughs> Everybody it uses shop. debit cards. It was cards. a restaurant. You know, it the, was a restaurant, not a coffee shop. The coffee, the coffee shops have to take cash because of their supply chain, but everybody else uses debit cards everywhere in the Netherlands. Like, I'll go and get the figures if, if you want. I there believe is, you. Nonetheless, this restaurant only took cash. <laughs> there is a very good point from uh, John Baines that uh, about 1.4 million people are unbanked in UK. Uh, so that's still quite hefty amount. So obviously we need to consider what happens to that group. But just before we finish- but, the but Ava, can Actually, I just I ask, have... I, I know these statistics in tedious Sorry, detail, 
So there, there's a million people that are unbanked, but that's not because that's not because they can't be banked. You know, in, in the UK, that you know, there's a government. You know, you have to have a basic bank account. It's the law. You know, banks have to give you a basic bank account. So my question is, what proportion of those unbanked people are unbanked because they can't get a bank account, and what proportion are unbanked because they don't want a bank account? It's, well, it's the very... other question is, what per percentage don't get a bank account because they're afraid of either the investigation that will take place or the, the, the consequences of applying for a bank account? There probably yeah. are some who are afraid they'll be outed as, I don't know, undocumented or not well, supposed right, to be but, here or yeah. something else. I actually had one other point I wanted to make, which is we were talking earlier about cities and you know, you were saying, Ava, that's, that London supports the rest of the UK. But there's part of your problem. If you have a London pound and you try to split that off from the rest of the country, you're going to end up with that becoming the national currency because um, London can't support itself in terms of food and everything else. I mean, it, it you know, the rest of the country does support London in a way. It will become cheaper. So people in London would find it more more cost effective to invest their london pounds in other parts of the country because their london pounds would buy more so if i'm if i'm going to you know right now when when i mean let's pick a stupid example right google opens a new office that employs 10,000 people they do it in kings cross where you already have a population density you know the i don't know whatever it is a gazillion like it couldn't be any more crowded so how come they how come they open it there and not in Transport? some other part of the country well, first of all, transport. Of course, but it will be it will be it will be vastly cheaper to to if if it was a floating exchange rate, it would be vastly cheaper to have that office somewhere up the train line or somewhere up the eight, think, M40 or I, I actually don't think it's the exchange rate that's the problem. I I, I think it's it's habit and it's what people want. I mean, that's you know, what, one of the reasons one of the one of the one of the things they're people people up until now, a lot of people have wanted to either live in or work in the city. And King's Cross, King's Cross is, you should never ever overlook the influence of legacy infrastructure. I mean, there's King's Cross with all those nice rail links. People can live in, you know, Essex and they can get to work in an hour. Okay, let me, let me, let me ask you to think about it another way then. Do you, th you know, one of the problems with the euro, uh, the euro has terrible problems because, as people say, the economy of Germany is just not the same as Greece. So when you force them all to use the same currency, that greatly benefits Germany. It's been terrible for Greece, right? Greek mm -hmm. holidays aren't as cheap as they used to be for Germans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if a single currency doesn't work for Germany and Greece because their economies are vastly different, why would a single currency work for London and Middlesbrough when their economies are almost entirely unrelated? They have nothing to do with each other. Surely it would make sense to have the exchange rate so that the currency of the rest of the UK fell and it became cheaper for people in London to buy stuff there. But actually, but actually how does that benefit the people in Middlesbrough? And in and any case, if, if you look at the States, I mean, the States has one currency for many, many wildly different economies. How's that working out? I don't think anybody thinks that changing the currency is the problem. I do. Okay, right. I think we can take that discussion in the virtual bar after, but uh, I just wanted to launch one more poll to ask you people, what do you think about the impact of COVID on UK and US? So how do we think uh, we will land. So are we expecting 10% unemployment by December 15? Drop of tax intake by 20% or, you know, whatever it will sort itself out as a lot of people in the press would like us to believe. So Keith, can I bring you on? Could you reply to it? If the unemployment is expected to be 15%, uh, how can we persuade the merchants to fund the UBI? Well, actually, there's a direct correlation. Um, the, the, the nice thing about currencies, cryptocurrencies, is if you accept them in return for goods and services, you're deeming them valuable. Um, you're, you're, you're actually giving conflicts in return for your dollars. Your dollars are worth the conflicts. And so if, if you're Sainsbury and your dollars goes into your wallet, 
um, you can spend them because you've just deemed them valuable. So it feels to me as if merchants can help themselves by accepting, just like they accept uh, rewards, like United Airlines will accept United Miles in part payment or full payment for an airline ticket. That model is scalable and could be made more ubiquitous. And uh, if they did it, they're creating their own value ecosystem. If their suppliers accepted it, they'd be creating the whole supply chain using their own value ecosystem. So it literally is as a, a simple as a decision to give people something they can spend. It will become valuable as a result. And uh, if you retain it for further spending, it's as good as money. So uh, logically, there's nothing to, to prevent it or to stop it. It's just a question of decision to do it. Okay, great. So I think to wrap it up, can I give to each of you one minute to just give your closing statement? So can I start from Troy? Are you still there, Troy? I think he's probably... Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Yes. So just to your, your takeaways from today. I think it's really, a, it's a bit of a broad brush kind of conversation, but the idea at the beginning was reclaiming money and the idea of who owns the money and who controls the money is, is a very important point. The concept behind the, the anarchy movement of Bitcoin is that no one owns it. And yet, whether we're talking about decentralized currency or even the majority of cryptocurrencies, someone still owns it. You know, the Libra Association will still own money. And so, I mean, to David's point, is he or are we still comfortable with the idea of literally no one owning money? Um, it, it's a great thought to kind of leave with, and I'll leave it with that. Thanks. Okay, David. I think one one thing that you haven't touched on is the, and I, I, I realize you know we haven't got time to talk about all of these things, but the debate about whether we're going to have Bitcoin or Chinese digital currency or digital dollars. I, th I think is far more important than it seems when we're discussing goods and services and things like that. You know, one of the reasons why the debate has suddenly accelerated is the recognition that, I I'm not saying this as a political point, I mean, whether you agree with it or not, a significant proportion of American um, soft power is delivered through the financial system. The, even the economist, which is hardly a radical you know, The Economist says America is capable of financial carpet bombing, which I think is a lovely phrase. Um, you know, look at what happened a few months ago when, was it Turkey, I think, the, the Americans got upset with Turkey because they wouldn't buy some planes or something, or they bought the wrong planes, I don't remember exactly. And so they threatened to cut Turkey off from the international financial system because three quarters of the world's transactions have at least one leg in dollars, which get cleared through New York money center banks. So the U.S. government can say, "Well, sorry, we'll just cut you off," and, and and of course they 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 caved. Well, the lesson I think a lot of countries around the world learn from things like that is not, "Well, next time we'll behave ourselves and do what the Americans say," but what if there was something that was a bit like money, but it wasn't run by the Americans? That's the lesson they take from that. And even a relatively small um, transfer of volume from U.S. dollars, which enjoy Actually, they're, 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 um, President Macron is in London today celebrating the, I don't know, the millionth anniversary of Agincourt. I can't remember exactly. But they were talking about Charles de Gaulle on the radio. And de Gaulle said America has an exorbitant privilege. That was his phrase, because it, it can denominate its debt in its own currency. A, a relatively small shift in international trading away from dollars to something else has major implications. It reduces American soft power. It increases the cost of American borrowing and debt. It's, it's not, you know, it's a point I wanted to make. I don't want to keep going on about my book, but the point is, you know, this is not an obscure technical discussion about whether we're going to use ERC-720 tokens or, you know, some centralized wallet system or whatever. Who runs money is a really big deal. And the fact that I think it's interesting and we should look at it and the fact that Eva thinks it and whatever, none of this matters. What matters is the governor of the Bank of England stood up last year and said, we need to look at in some form of what he calls an SHC, a synthetic hegemonic currency, 
to deal with his words, not mine, the destabilizing influence of the US dollar. So the fact that people like us are interested in digital currency all of a sudden, it, it, it's, that's not really the important thing. That's not why it's a big deal. It's a big deal because people like the governor of the Bank of England are talking about it. And, and that's why formulating new ideas and new policies for that, for that world, I, I think that's why it's important. It's fun talking about London pounds or whatever. And I meant what I said about that. But that's not why people are talking about this stuff now. They're talking about it now because globally it's become, you know, if, if China is successful at exporting its digital currency along the Belt and Road, forget about Chinese digital currency for domestic consumption. It will make no difference to the average Chinese consumer. They already pay for everything using their mobile phones anyway. But suppose the average farmer in, in Africa somewhere who buys his tractor and his fertilizer from China and sells his, whatever it is they sell to China, soybeans or something, I don't know. Um, that farmer is going to get fed up with, you know, getting dollars and changing them into the local currency. And then he's got to change them back to get one and he's got to send it to China. And then when he decides to send some of his money to his cousin in Afghanistan, he's not allowed to because of US Treasury restriction. You know, sooner or later, that guy is going to start seeing the Chinese app as Keith's universal wallet. He's just going, well, why don't I just use the Chinese app and I'll get, I'll use Chinese digital currency for everything because I can do what I like with it. And so I, I just, I want to make a, just a, just want to make a serious point. You know, the, please don't think of this debate about digital currency as some obscure corner of the cryptocurrency world. It, it's far from that. It's a, it's really a much more important discussion. The proof of that is what the reaction was to Facebook's initial Libra um, claims. And, uh, and literally, they were called to Congress, to the British Parliament, to account for themselves because it was so scary. But the fact is, if not Libra, then what? And, and there has to be an answer to that because, it, 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 David, you're... you're your um, guess about America and the dollar is inevitable. The dollar will not, cannot continue to play the role of the primary reserve currency for world trade. Uh, the relative decline of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the world economy by 2030, two thirds of the world's middle class are gonna be in Asia. Yeah. So uh, yeah. China clearly is not well positioned to fill the void. And so from a human race point of view, something has to, and it won't be a national currency. It just won't. So what will it be? And I think the human race has an interest in the answer to that question. If it could be bottoms up money, um, uh, you know, non-governmental, that would be fantastic. Could it be that? Well, massive amount of challenges, massive amount of challenges. No, no, I, I, but I think you're right, Keith. I think, you know, we can't, we you know, actually, the global monetary system changes, you know, reasonably regularly. I mean, we, we sort of imagine that the way money works is a law of nature. Um, but it really isn't. It's only been this way since 1945. But, um, but I can see sort of two possibilities out of the corner of my eye there. I can see, uh, you know, I'm very wedded to this more city centric version of the future. But I think another perfectly reasonable vision is, is Edward de Bono's you know, he, he wrote this thing, the IBM dollar, and he said, well, you know, why, why, why have money as the intermediary? Why not just have companies? Why not just have people who produce things, have their own money, which is essentially, you know, forward sales. It would be like me getting paid in Amazon vouchers or something. Um, and then when companies buy and sell, they'll just buy and sell by trading baskets of these assets. And, and considering he wrote that before the internet and before mobile phones and so on, I think it was sort of quite prescient. So I agree with you that things cannot stay the way they are and history says they won't, why would they? But it is very, it's a very interesting time to start thinking about what will come next. And in case, I think it's always nicer if someone else does this, so. The currency called war, nice. To sum up, from my notes, from our discussions, and from our, our interactive polls, uh, we have shown three things. So first, Bitcoin is tipped as the winner of digital currency wars. There might be issues, but it's definitely the most promising. Two, 
London needs its own money to improve lives of people who work and live here. So we as Cybersol, we've moved towards forming a movement to support launching a London coin. And three, UBI will become a necessity, but not implemented by state, but by your local city or town, which is similar to Swiss model, where cantons support financially their local community. So for now, big thank you to all our speakers, David Birch, Wendy Grossman, Keith Tier, and Troy Norcross. Thank you so much, guys. It was an amazing discussion. So please, everybody, do not forget to buy an amazing book by David. The title is The Currencies Cold War. And please sign up to cybersalon.org for the next series of Digital Futures event. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>